Uh, so the city estimates right now there's still over 30,000 homes that are still affected with mold and still dealing with mold issues. Uh, the recent survey that was done in March or April found that still over half of the people that are living in these homes said that they still smell it or they see it or they still feel like it's there. Uh, so that's, it's still a big problem. Uh, you know, even though Sandy was six months ago, the mold is still there. We fix systems, we have power back again, uh, but to have to deal with that, especially when we think about asthma rates uh, and people getting sick from things like that, and feeling very, very frustrated. You know, anybody in here that's an owner or manager that's dealt with a resident who has a long-term mold issue, it's tough. It's very, because we need everybody to participate in the process. Uh, when we think about multifamily buildings, it's all, we're all on the same team. We may not have our own apartment, but we all live together. We have the asset manager, we have the site manager, we have the super, we have the maintenance staff, we have the owner, we have the residents. Everybody plays a part in making sure that the building is healthy. If we have residents that don't report mold problems right away, then they get a lot worse. So we have to have a management staff that makes the residents feel comfortable to come and tell them that there's a mold problem. If they feel afraid to tell that there's a problem, then that's, much, that's more money down the road that the owner and manager has to pay for. Sometimes just simple signage in the building. You guys have all seen it before. If you have a water leak, please tell us. You know, we can have the same signage about mold. If, if you have mold in your apartment, if you smell mold, please let us know. If you see pests, we have the same issue with bed bugs. There's such a stigma around that that nobody wants to say anything. And then much later on, it's much more expensive because now other people in the building have the same problem. So mold is the same thing. We have to make people feel comfortable to report it. But once they do, we have to have an action plan in place that's part of our regular O&M. Maintenance staff and the super need to be on top of that, but they also need to be armed with the tools to deal with it. You know, do you need a commercial dehumidifier on site? Do you live in a really wet area? People that are in zone A should probably consider getting a commercial dehumidifier so that as soon as there's water in the building, we can start drying it out. The asset managers and the site managers should have a direct line of communication so again, residents feel comfortable with reporting problems. But the resident engagement piece, I understand, is kind of a, it works in some buildings. Some buildings have, some buildings don't have a great situation between super and maintenance staff and residents. So sometimes we have to work at healing that situation so that people feel more comfortable reporting problems. And honestly, I, doing some of the work through Sandy afterwards and just volunteering, I saw a lot of those relationships were healed because everybody kind of had to come together to figure out how how do, how do we deal with this? We don't have power, we don't have water, we have seniors in the building that need help, that need medication and food. Uh, so going through that, and I'm sure you guys experienced the same thing. You know, People talk to their neighbors that had never talked to their neighbors in 10 years living in one building. So it was a very unfortunate incident, but to see how the city and people came together to help each other, I think did help, help fix some of those situations so people do feel more comfortable now. Uh, as I mentioned, the Department of Health in New Jersey actually just released it this morning their black mold guidelines. So there is a plethora of information out there that's free and available to anybody uh, online and there's free trainings on all five boroughs in New Jersey so that people can go and find out how to identify it and what are good cleanup strategies. So identifying mold. We just want you guys to have this for your own information but I'll just give some quick tips. Everybody knows what it looks like. It's slimy, it's black, it's green, it's fuzzy. Uh, it, it has a very distinct smell. So if it's there, again, don't waste money on air quality testing. If you really want to know what kind of mold it is, there's a couple labs across the country. You just stick a piece of tape to it, you send it away, they can tell you what it is. The one reason you might want to know, especially for people who are immunocompromised, seniors, infants, anybody that's just had surgery, Stachybotrys is that toxic black mold that can make people very sick. Uh, and in very few cases, people actually can die from exposure if you're sensitive to it. Also, people who have bad allergies um, or that have asthma can be very sensitive to mold, too. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, and they were actually discussing the allergy season this year. If anybody deals with allergies, as I do, it's been a little rough this year. Uh, and they've been talking about in certain areas that were greatly affected and still have a lot of mold issues. That means there's a lot of extra mold spores in the area in general. So if we're living in multifamily buildings where there's a lot of mold in the basements and the bottom floors, that's getting up through the rest of the building. It doesn't just stay in your apartment because air moves throughout the entire building. So these, like I said, all of the building materials, unfortunately, are some of mold's favorite foods, especially behind stuff. Uh, wallpaper, for one, because we're using a glue and it's wet behind there, especially when it gets wet, it takes a long time to drop. If anybody's ever put up wallpaper, it's kind of annoying to put up and line the whole thing up and you have to wait for it to dry and put a fan on it. If people don't let that stuff dry fast enough, 
mold can grow behind there within 48 hours. And then we don't see it for a long time, because some of those coverings are vinyl, and it takes a really long time for the mold to get through. So we want to make sure things are dried out. Even simple things like apartment turnover. When we have wet carpets or we're shampooing carpets, and this has probably happened to you guys in buildings where somebody comes in, does apartment turnover, closes the window, shuts the door, leaves. And then you go to show the apartment, and then the whole place reeks of mold because we didn't allow it to dry out. Again, integrating things like this into our daily operating plan. These are all, what we're talking about here today is not new technology, it's not new ideas. These are things that we should be doing normally uh, and that should be integrated, especially with super and maintenance staff, our boots on the ground. This has to be the, the immediate and normal reaction that they have. Um, the exterior, now this is obviously very sandy specific because it's not often that the entire first floor of our home is underwater and that we're experiencing the outside of the building getting completely soaking wet. So anybody that had vinyl siding, like I said, in some cases had to take it off and let that dry. If they didn't, now that we're, now we're seeing in the past couple months serious mold issues now that the sun is out and it's hot out, uh, so they're having to take that off and clean that. So I mentioned air movement before. I just wanted to give you guys kind of an idea how air moves through buildings. So we have air moving from apartment to apartment. And these are just come some of the common infiltration areas where we see air moving back and forth. Anywhere that air can go, moisture can go, smoke can go, pollutants can go, and pests. So that's why there's never just one cockroach, and it's never just you with cockroaches. We all have cockroaches, because they can all travel throughout the building. So when we fix and seal up these holes that we're dealing, we're stopping a lot of these pollutants from moving back and forth. So we have electrical and plumbing penetrations, uh, we have demising walls, and we also have that wall-to-floor connection. And for any of you guys in construction, you know underneath that baseboard, usually the wall actually doesn't meet the floor. So we have a gap right there. And there is actually a mold-resistant cock that you can put in there. So on those first floor areas where we're sealing that up, we can put that in there. Not that it's going to stop all the mold. We're going to talk about mold-resistant materials. It doesn't mean that you're never going to get mold. But just like in the situation you mentioned, you guys had a flood and you ripped everything out. If you have mold-resistant materials in there, it means that you have a little bit longer before mold starts to grow because there's a much less organic material that's in there. So we have air movement from unit to unit. So we're moving through apartments, but then we have air movement in multifamily buildings all throughout. And we have something stack effect or chimney effect or whatever you guys want to call it. Air comes in at the bottom, it moves up through the rest of the building, and it carries with it all of those pollutants. So when we seal up holes from unit to unit, we're almost like we're stacking single family homes on top of each other. So this helps control, and these are kind of preventative measures that you can take in the future in sealing up your building. All the ceiling that I'm talking about also helps save money on heating costs. So again, if we're trying to find ways for owners and managers to justify doing something like this, it helps a lot with health and safety in the building, but it also helps cut costs because we're not losing as much of our conditioned air out of the building. Central ventilation systems. Most buildings, not most, but a lot of buildings in New York have that roof fan on the top, the mushroom fan on the top, and then down the building there's a grill in the kitchen and in the bathroom. <coughs> Those grills, if they're connected between units, sometimes units share bathrooms or they share kitchens, that's another pathway that we're traveling, fluids are now traveling throughout the building. I would say 99% of the time, those systems are not working the way that they're designed. But if you, if you think about the, the idea behind that system, it's not a very good idea because there's so many ways for those systems to leak. So we have all this leakage throughout the building, so we're pulling some air out, but we're not pulling enough. And in some cases, we're pulling too much air and we're wasting money on the heating because we're pulling out too much of the conditioned air that's in there. If it's working properly, it should be pulling out the right amount of air, meeting code. New York City has codes around how much air has to be exhausted from a building, and we're getting those pollutants out. So that's why we have it in the kitchen and the bathroom, because in the kitchen we have gas stoves, uh, which is very common, and I'm sure most people here have a gas stove in their kitchen and living in the city that creates carbon monoxide. We have to get that out of there. So for those of you who maybe live in buildings where there's no window, I mean there's no ventilation system, you have a window, make sure you open that when you're cooking. Carbon monoxide can build up. Moisture also builds up from cooking. People, we create a lot of moisture. We create about a lot of our own mold problems. Uh, and I've seen this a lot where people, you know, they, they complain, they don't understand why there's mold in their bathroom, but they've covered up the grill in the bathroom. So we don't have any more ventilation, we don't have any more air movement in there. And that's why we have these systems, to make sure that we get enough fresh air in there. When you, if you guys went through any mold abatement process, 
after Sandy, you probably notice that they came in with big fans. There has to be an exhaust system. Do not tie into your existing exhaust system. You need to have a separate exhaust system during mold abatement because now we're sucking mold spores throughout the rest of the buildings, their ventilation system. And I've, before I just mentioned those connections that we share sometimes, so then you're just spraying it throughout the entire building and you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do that for any type of construction. You're supposed to have your own dedicated ventilation system for those spaces. And seal it up. If it's just one unit that you're fixing a mold problem, seal up you know, the doorways, tape that stuff off before you clean it. Because like I said, it's very easy for spores to just travel throughout the rest of the building. Wet basements are a very unseen culprit of mold issues, especially in multifamily buildings uh, where residents don't go in basements. So they don't know where the problem's coming from and they just all of a sudden start to see mold in their apartments. If we're seeing mold in the first and second floor, you can only imagine how bad the basement is. So we wanna make sure that's something that we're checking on. Uh, and New York has pretty wet basements. You know, we've all been down there, we've all been in the boiler room. They're pretty wet, hot, dark areas, which is perfect for mold. So we have to make sure that we're checking on those and keeping them dried out. So we have more than just flooding, there's a lot of other areas that moisture can come from. We have roof leaks, uh, which often comes from flashing not being good, and roof leaks are tough. If you guys have gone through that, the leak might be over here, but if you go up on the roof, it might be all the way over here. You can find that with infrared cameras, if you guys don't want to do the spray the entire roof and then wait and see where it comes in from. Uh, infrared cameras, right before the sun comes up, you can start to see the part of the roof that's wet where the leak is going in is not going to heat up as fast as the rest of the roof. So you'll see different temperature colors, and that's a good way to tell. Right like before the sun comes up or when the sun's going down, that's when you'll start to see that temperature difference. Missing downspouts and gutters. When you see a roof that has a bunch of water on top of it, and it's not draining properly, especially when drains run down the middle of the building and not on the outside. That's another way that mold can get, or moisture can get inside the building. Damaged building materials. Again, very specific to Sandy, where we saw so much of our materials, our drywall and our wood beams and all that stuff gets really, really wet. In a lot of cases, people can afford to rip that stuff all out. So they cleaned up as best they could, but once some of that stuff is wet, it's got to be removed, especially insulation. And stuff that's behind the wall needs to be checked on. Um, failure of membranes and balconies. Go ahead. Why is insulation a good medium for mold? Isn't that an organic material? It still grows on it, but it is. Most of it is an organic material. Uh, but first of all, when it gets wet, the R value goes way down. So the performance of the insulation goes way down. Uh, and that's why a lot of times with roof leaks, you'll start to see big spots in the infrared camera because the insulation just is useless now. So almost more from an energy standpoint, the insulation should be taken out. But it does grow on it, but not as much as, say, wood or drywall. Balconies, not that there's, I mean, there's a good amount of balconies in New York, but that connection right there, uh, water can come in, the connection to the building. And you guys will see it sometimes when you, if you're walking and you look up, at balconies, the undersides of balconies, often you'll see a lot of different uh, water damage uh, where water has collected or it's coming down the side of the building. Cox and ceilings, we want to make sure that those are in good condition. Outside of New York, they say stuff like that, weather stripping and cox and ceilings, five to ten years. New York City affordable housing, two to three years. That stuff doesn't last as long as the manufacturer tells you in buildings in New York. So that should, again, be something that's part of your normal operating plan, checking on that stuff. Especially now, knowing that the storm season is going to be much worse, making sure that we're sealed up as much as possible. Um, improper vapor barriers, that's during construction. If we have condensation happening on the wrong side of that, then we get wet walls, then we get wet insulation. Sometimes people will complain about that. My walls are wet or I have condensation on it. We have bad insulation, uh, so we're that where we're hitting, where the hot and cold are meeting is happening on the inside and getting the walls all wet. Um, and inadequate interior moisture removal, not good enough ventilation. Ice damming is more for, you know, a pitch roof, but if you, you guys have seen that before in the edges of a roof, you'll see crazy icicles hanging off the edges. We have hot air going up in the attics of building, hitting that cold surface, melting the snow on the top of the roof, and it comes down to the edge where it's cold again, and it creates all of that ice. And that can get pushed, it can get so thick it gets pushed back into the roof, and it gets all that moisture that's inside of there. So attics also, attics and crawl spaces, these kind of hidden spaces where moisture can build up that we might not check on until it's too late and the mold problem has gotten really bad. And by too late, I mean very expensive. It can be fixed, but it's just gonna be a lot more expensive than maybe if somebody, if, again, if it was part of your normal checklist of things to look at, especially living in a wet environment like we do. 
we make a lot of moisture inside. We cook a lot of food. We have lots of people in our apartments. We have a lot of over-occupied buildings. Uh, so there's a lot of sources of moisture. We have pets. We have plants. Uh, there's actually, I've seen a few apartments that just had too many plants. You almost can create like a, a rainforest effect in a tiny space with having too much. Wall condensation, as I mentioned, is wet walls that can sometimes be fixed with just adding insulation. So after a flood, we want to clean and dry everything out within 24 to 48 hours. I would really consider, especially Zone A buildings, getting a commercial dehumidifier. Don't keep it in the basement. No more keeping that stuff in the basement because if it floods, it's going to get wet again. Uh, especially for management companies, they're not cheap. I'm not sure how much they cost. You can rent them. Uh, but again, if this is something that we're going to have to get used to, it might be worth it to just have one uh, that, that people can use it in their buildings. Uh, but you can, like I said, rent one from Lowe's or Home Depot. Biocide. Does anybody use biocide to treat mold? Kind of looks like a spray. It almost looks like a pesticide spray. It has a high global warming potential. It's nasty stuff. It does help with mold, but again, we don't need to use it. We don't need to use a chemical like that. We can use a normal detergent. This is from the National Center for Healthy Housing. I don't have this link in there, but you guys can see it's just nchh.org. The National Center is great. They just, all they focus on is healthy strategies for buildings. They have tons of free signage and resources and all that stuff. Because uh, I mentioned when you're trying to make that relationship between management and residents a good one, uh, a simple thing like signage can help. Just a, a reminder to people, this is who you should call if you're smelling or seeing mold. Not everybody knows. You know, you guys in this room today are very familiar with what we're, what we're talking about. We have to remember that not everybody is as familiar as we are, and that they might not know, they actually might not know what that is or how to report it. So cleaning it up. This is for bad situations. This is actually the city recommendations that they gave after Sandy. So there's regular mold in your bathroom from not opening the window that's maybe this big. You can just use, you know, dish detergent or laundry detergent. If we're talking a big, situ a big mold cleanup job, we want to make sure that we're wearing an N95 dust mask. That's just a rating for how good it is at stopping things coming through the mask. So N95 is the recommendation. Isolating the area and having fans in there. Again, don't tie into the existing exhaust system. You need to have your own exhaust system taking it away from the area that you're working in and taping off all the other areas. Disc detergents, and the reason that they work so well is the surfacant that keeps things on the surface. So you can use a green laundry detergent. Yes, they're a little expensive and maybe you don't want to use it to clean up. But if you guys are interested in greener alternatives, like I said, I'm not going to tell you to not use bleach, but you can use other materials that are going to do the same thing. And you don't <clears throat> dry out your home before replacing the walls. This is one of the biggest mistakes that contractors made after Sandy, is that we were trying to, just as you mentioned, the rapid repair, rapidly fixing things, doesn't allow for us to dry things out. So when we took out materials and just put new ones in, not everything was dried off yet. So then we still, and there was still a lot of mold spores in the air. The other problem with uh, some of the damage in the mold that we saw is it wasn't just normal water. We're talking seawater and sewage. You know, water from the East River, which nobody wants to drink or swim in that. Maybe you do, I don't know. But <laughs> getting that in a building mixed with sewage and then having that dried on the surface, now we're not talking just regular water damage. And this is a little bit scarier in terms of the mold front. So that's some, that's not, you should always be careful. All mold should be treated the same during cleanup, but it should be treated the same that it's, it could all be dangerous. Because we're not, we don't, we're not testing it. We don't actually know what's in there. Treat it all the same as a potential health hazard. So this is an example. This building had wallpaper, as you guys can see. This is actually an older picture, but I just wanted to give an example of what mold cleanup should look like. If there's just a couple people, they don't have any masks on, they don't have any trash bags bagging things up, if they don't have their own fan, they don't have a dehumidifier, they're probably a bunch of jokers and they don't know what they're doing. So make sure not that you guys are you know, going to be the experts, but I want everybody to be armed with the tools to at least know what they should be looking for and understand what contractors are doing. And just like you mentioned before, you've got to be on, you have to be watching and paying attention. That's true with any construction job. You know, that's, we want to make sure that people are you know, implementing what we want in the way that we want it. The New, York City, the, the New York City Guide for Mold that's been on the books for a very long time is actually used throughout the country because it's such a problem in New York that we've, you know, we created our own guidebook a long time ago. But 
Many other cities have based it on ours, and like I said, it's always the same recommendations. Everything has to be dry. Then we have to take everything out of the space, let that stuff dry out, replace wet building materials, use mold-resistant materials, and we put it back in again. Natural cleaners, for those of you that are interested in using natural cleaners, is like I said, you don't need to use bleach. Before you use any kind of cleaner, make sure everything's dry in there. You can use laundry or disc detergent, green or non-green, but that's not as those materials will not be as bad as using bleach. White vinegar. White vinegar in a spray bottle can be used to kill mold. You can spray it on all the wooden surfaces, whatever you want to do, but white vinegar works as well. There's essential oils. Essential oils work, but they're expensive. So that's more for you guys. You know, if you want to use that in your own homes, they do work very well. But when we're talking about large multifamily buildings, I completely recognize that it's not feasible to go buy a, you know, a gallon jug of grapefruit, you know, grapefruit <laughs> seed I've tried that's going to be $500. So I get that. It can be diluted. But just so you guys know for your own information, you can use things like that to stop mold growth. But white vinegar works great. Uh, and I would say dish detergent is probably the other one. Hydrogen peroxide actually is very similar to bleach in the way that it kills mold. Hydrogen peroxide is much more affordable than, say, some of the other essential oils that are there. If the actual material is wet, then you want to remove it. You're going to be just cleaning in like a bathroom situation. Sometimes we see the mold growth in the shower. Even on bathroom tiles, that stuff, that, that stuff can just be clean. But if the material itself is wet. Well, did you have your hand up? Um, no, no question. I was yeah. seeing things. Is there some like um, preemptive cleaning, like you clean it ahead of time, like say this? Um, Flooding, um, potential flooding, so we clean with a white vinegar or something. Can you, could you do that? Mm, not, not in terms of preventive cleaning, but there are materials, which I'm going to list, that will be, they're not as prone to mold growth. So then that gives you more time after things are wet to get in there and dry everything out. Like a uh, paperless drywall and things like that, uh, which are a little, they're a little bit more expensive, not that much more expensive, but if we're thinking about moving into an era where we're dealing with wet drywall all the time, it becomes more cost effective to have materials like that. So if anybody's ever dealt with mold exposure that was bad enough, uh, and you maybe have and you just didn't realize that's what it was, it's very similar to allergies. But the problem is, is that people who are asthmatic or who are you know, immunocompromised, this can be very dangerous for them. So we might just get a little sneezy uh, but other people can end up in the hospital because of it. And like I said, it's very similar to allergies, and I'm sure most of you guys have experienced it before. So these are some of the material you have. Are you going to talk more about health stuff later, health impacts? No, go, go ahead. What was your question? Um, are there long-term, like, degenerative respiratory effects from living in a moldy apartment? From living in a what? A moldy apartment, say. Like, is it, like, mm -hmm. right now, my health sucks because there is mold all over my apartment, but once that mold is taken care of, do I recover or do I not recover? There are, so that's, that's a great question. There's actually a lot of studies around what happens to people who live in buildings versus people who live in a healthier building, so to speak. There's actually a recent report from Mount Sinai that just did a study on the Altona a building in the Bronx. It's a green building. Monitored people before they moved in and people uh, after they moved in to see what the effects were on them. So there's the long-term health effects of respiratory illness. That, if you, if you move away from the area that's causing the problem, or the building that's causing the problem, or whatever the source is, yes, you can get better. Uh, for somebody like me, I'm only gonna get so much better because I have asthma. So my asthma, my incidence of asthma will go down once I move away from it, but I'm always gonna have that problem. It's gonna be much worse living in a building with that. The other upside to that is how many days of work do you miss because you are exposed to mold and you're sick, uh, if you're fatigued. The other part of that is stress. It's very, very stressful and can be actually very traumatic for some people to go through an experience like that. And Sandy was extremely traumatic for a lot of people and to think that they're still dealing with it and they don't get their homes back. And in some cases, people will, are just never gonna get their homes back because they're too, they're too damaged. So when we think about long-term effects, you can think about the financial implications of having to deal with that for so long, uh, the stress that you get from that, which stress leads to a myriad of health problems. So yes, moving away from that can help increase you know, people's health, but if you are going into it with a you know, previous condition, you might only return to that condition before.
Erica, um, I think earlier you said um, mole in some cases were uh, associated with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I went, well, I, I brought that up because I have a sister dealing with a, a mm -hmm. mole issue in her apartment for years with her landlord. Mm -hmm. And it's because the way they did the steam riser, yep. they put the um, air valve right on top. In her apartment? Yeah. And, it's, and no matter what you're doing, what a lot of people do is clean it up. And then they think they could take uh, kilts yep. and put makeup on it. Yep. And that's all you're doing, yep. putting makeup on it, but more still there. Mm -hmm. So, and she has cancer. Mm -hmm. um, an another thing was that when I was dealing with the mold situation, my office getting headaches, mm -hmm. I went to Columbia Presbyterian. I saw a lung, a lung specialist. Mm -hmm. And he said that's really not proven mm -hmm. medically. It's like a debate. It is a debate. It's it really a debate is. going on that it's not mm -hmm. medically proven that mold can affect you like that. Mm -hmm. So it's still, mm -hmm. you know, a back and forth battle that yes it does, no it doesn't. But no, I know, I'm glad that you brought it up. The medical field is actually pretty split on on the on how mold can affect you. Some people think that if it's, the evidence isn't really there to draw that direct correlation. And then there's, you know, the doctors who, there's a woman who's running a clinic in Queens and she said that, you know, since Sandy, the number of kids that have come in with asthma attacks went way up. And that she has actually started surveying their parents to see if they are living in places that were affected and the buildings got wet. And she said that almost all of them are. So that's the, I think that's a good correlation. But when we there are other doctors that say we can't. There's too many other health factors there yeah. to say that it's strictly from mold. Uh, but I think that's you know in situations where you know like Liz you mentioned bathroom mold, it's hard to say. You know, I'm, I'm in the hospital because of my bathroom mold, but when we think about Sandy and all of the mold that's there, it's hard to say that that's not affecting somebody. But people who are already in bad health to be exposed to something like that is, is definitely bad for them. And mold stop growing? Yes, it can stop growing. And you can, you can kill it. Uh, like I said, bleach kills it, but those other cleaners that I mentioned, they kill it in the same way. Um, I live in the Lower East Side, our basement's got it with like six feet of water. Yeah. They did was open up all the doors mm -hmm. so that they didn't want to share. Yep. Mm -hmm. Seems that stops us about like one foot on the sheet block on the bottom that mm -hmm. has spores, but it hasn't spread. But it hasn't gone up. Uh, and then that's having enough fresh air in there is very important. But making sure to make sure it's dried out before we put in the new building material. So they probably replaced a lot of the drywall. I haven't done that thing yet. Oh, that's, so it's not as bad, maybe? Yeah, that's why I actually was excited. Yeah. It could stop growing. As long as you keep it dry down there, but again, if you're if it's an area that's going to get wet again in the future, maybe we want to switch to um, Georgia Pacific makes a paperless uh, gypsum board that has a fiberglass coating on it, so it takes much much longer for mold to grow on those types of surfaces. So if and when you guys do replace it, that's something to think about. So that's the paperless one. There's also just standard mold resistant sheetrock uh, that the, the the new stuff from Georgia Pacific we've seen used in new construction projects. People really like it. But there's also just a straight mold resistant that has, it's not as good as that, but it's still pretty good. I'm assuming there's a higher cost to so the sheet rock. There is. Is that cost effective in the long run? I'm going to have to remove it anyway. Yeah. So. The, I think it is cost effective in the long run because of what the new environment is. If we're going to get flooded again and again and again, it's, you know, the 100 year storm event is no longer a 100 year storm event. 100 year storm events are happening every 5 to 10 to 20 years in cities all over the world. So in that sense, it is cost effective to spend a little bit more now so we don't have to spend so much later. But again, I, I missed your point. You want to remove it anyway. Mm -hmm. Would you want to remove it right away to run out and use it? Yes. But then if you're going to place this paper, it's still going to be moving it from there. Well, these, these ones maybe don't, it will be less. But you're totally right that you might have to still remove it. But if the flooding is not that bad, this stuff won't grow mold and it dries out faster. No, it's a good point to make that you know down the road we're still going to have to replace this stuff anyways. If this makes it less, I don't know, just want to make sure that you guys know that there's products out there that you can use. But that's a, that's a very valid point, especially from a management perspective. If we're going to have to replace stuff anyways, what is the most cost effective material that's out there? Uh, this is more expensive than just a straight mold resistant uh, gypsum board, and that's. Almost the same price as right here. Erica, what we're doing at the beach, we're not putting back yard and insulation. Yeah. installation. We're doing the spray installation mm -hmm. because if it reoccurs, you just have to really wash it down. Yep. 
and um, we're doing the um, sheetrock drywall that's uh, moisture resistant. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it kind of like really helps out mm -hmm. if it ever reoccurs. So how did you guys, what were the resources for you guys to know to do that? Did you already know that? No, or? we have, uh, we, 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 we're doing the project with um, the Office of Mental Health. Okay. And they brought in an architect, we brought in engineers, mm -hmm. and you know, they uh, mm -hmm. went through the specs and everything, how we need to address So you guys it. were kind of using some outside resources to, right. great. Right, because especially with mold in New York City codes, you're being inspected, anything over 30, yep. 30 inches, you're really supposed to call in a professional yep. to isolate and remove. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that metric actually came from the New York City's Toxic Mold Task Force. Is they, their task was to figure out what, how much area is too much area. So when, when is it? When do you call a professional? When do you not? Because as you mentioned, the medical field is split. Uh, the real estate field was kind of split on what is too much mold, what's not enough mold. When do we care? When do we not care? So 30 square inches uh, is when you're actually supposed to call somebody. As per New York City. I know the building, building resilience task force report has gone out yet, but the mold resilience task force today has recommendations. So that last question was more like, mm -hmm. in the basement, you should use anything that you want to use, but yeah. then first floor up, you should use the mold resistance task force. They are. So that um, I'm glad you brought that up. So the Urban Green and the city are having, they have their own resiliency task force. And if you go on the Urban Green website, they have a draft, with their, which is their list of recommendations as of right now. It's going to be finalized. But they are addressing everything from energy and CHP and backup generators all the way down to resin engagement and what kind of materials that we should use going forward. So that's going to be a great resource to the city. Uh, and that's free, just like the New York City Mold Awareness Program, free training and free license checks. So all that stuff is meant to be free for everybody. Uh, except the rapid repair is for low income. So there's the mold, there's actually mold resistant wood, which I actually did not know of until I was doing a little more research to come and talk to you guys today to make sure that I was getting all the materials that are out there. My only, not issue, but concern with a mold resistant wood is what it's treated with. So if you guys are really trying to think about what kind of chemicals you're putting in your building. Um, mold resistant wood, maybe, maybe you don't need it in the entire building, but on those bottom floors, maybe that's a good application for it, but maybe not you know, throughout everybody's units where it could be off-gassing chemicals. So it's kind of a balance that we have to play with. What kind of chemicals are we putting in? What's best for the building? What's best for the residents? Uh, and that's you know, up to the owners and managers, and hopefully you know, the residents need to play a part in that too. Uh, and that's why, like I said before, it's kind of a, a team approach. It's not just one pure person making decisions that don't affect anybody. It affects everybody in their homes. Avoid carpeting. New York City doesn't have a lot of carpeting. Uh, it's actually much more common outside of the city. But even residents who maybe sometimes put in their own carpeting, which we see a lot, maybe they just nail it down. But any carpet that is nailed down to the floor that we can't pick up and clean and move, uh, that is prone to so many things, not just moisture damage, but it's like roach hotels and bed bugs and dust mites and asthma triggers. Carpets like that could be pretty nasty, especially in multifamily situations where there's so many people that are going to be exposed to it and we're maybe not changing it for you know five to seven years at a time. Uh, and if anybody's smoking in their apartments, carpeted, you know, carpeted apartments that have a smoker in it, it's a it's a cost savings. When you get rid of carpets, you don't have to change them as much anymore, especially when you're allowing people to smoke in their apartments. Moisture meters. Moisture meters are a couple hundred bucks. They're, I also recommend people having these, especially in Zone A buildings. All it's going to do is tell you guys if it's dried out or not, and it'll give you a humidity reading. So humidity in New York, 30 to 50 percent. When we start jumping to 60 percent and 70 percent humidity, that's when we want to be a little concerned, uh, and that's because that's prime for mold growth. So a humidity meter, like I said, it's not it's not it's not cheap, but it's not that that expensive, especially if we're getting one for one company. But it really, what it's going to help you guys do is if you're paying a contractor to come in and do work around mold, you can check with your own moisture meter to see if it's dried out yet or not. So before they close up the walls, you can say, I'm still showing some moisture in here. You know, it's my opinion that you guys should wait another day. So again, just having the resources so that you guys can fight your own battle and you're not at the mercy of what the contractor is telling you, especially when we're thinking about things like rapid repair. So we want to make sure it's dried out. Uh, integrating mold response plans. The mold awareness program from the city has a very clear guidelines on what your mold response plan should be. And the resiliency task force is going to have recommendations, not just around mold, but around anything that has to do with resiliency in buildings. Uh, and again, those are all free resources. 
Okay. So the other reason, I just wanted to show you guys why it's important to think about air quality, um, especially when we think about asthma rates. New York City has some of the highest asthma rates for kids. It is one of the number one reasons why kids go to the hospital is from asthma attacks. They're horrible to experience. It's like a person is sitting on your chest, you can't breathe, and you can't get enough air. When kids have asthma attacks, they, have, they start to hyperventilate because they're having an anxiety attack because they're afraid of what's happening to them. That's what sends them to the hospital. I don't know if you guys can afford you know, emergency visits to the hospital, but most people can't. And when we look at areas um, way up in the Bronx and in East New York, when we have one in two and one in three kids that have asthma, their parents cannot afford to take their kid to the doctor and to the hospital all the time for asthma attacks. So if there's things in our buildings that are causing that that we can fix, like I said when I first started, that should be on the top of our list. It really, really should. It's, it's, really, it's horrible to watch a kid go through that. And it's not just kids, it's adults and people who are immunocompromised that experience asthma attacks. So this is 2001. You guys can see the red is almost 12% of adults that have asthma. So this is 2001, this is 2010. This is nine years later. Now it's the entire country, that's 12%. So what it was before versus now. It is one of the country's most, it's the highest rate of chronic disease in the entire country. I'm actually surprised I didn't see more hands go up when I asked uh, if anybody in the room had asthma. <coughs> And what it, why it's a, big, it's a big public health concern, it's expensive. It's very expensive to deal with asthma. If any, if any of you guys have had kids that have gone through this, the medication is not cheap and it's not free and neither are doctor visits. And again, we're talking about the highest rates in communities where people can't afford this stuff anyways. So, New York City Resources. I've talked a lot about the Mold Awareness Program. I think I put the link in here for you guys. Uh, but I think one of the greatest things, not the greatest things, but something that will be really helpful is the license check. Because sometimes we're really at the mercy of whatever contractors are telling us, so we can at least check to see uh, if they're qualified to do the work. Cleaning products. Again, if you guys are interested in going the green, the green cleaning product route, which I hope that you are, uh, I didn't talk tons about that today because I wanted to focus on the mold side of it, but I encourage you to go home and read the label on some of the stuff that's in, underneath your sink. Read about all the different ways it can kill you. It's, it's a great story about how it can burn your eyes out, it can burn your skin, it can make you puke. Here's the number to poison control. But we keep this stuff not only in our house, but where do we keep it? Under the sink, right? How tall is your kid? About this tall. Do we lock those doors? No, not that many people. 80% of people who keep pesticides in their home keep them unlocked and under the sink. Pesticides can kill people immediately. Drano can kill kids immediately. This is, a, think about what you have in your home. You know, when we think about other ways that, that we're very concerned about safety, those are very, very toxic products which are right underneath your sink. So these are some recommendations for you guys to think about when you're trying to figure out what is a good green cleaning product. There's a lot of green washing out there, which essentially is lying about a product being green or not. Just because the package is green or there's a happy kid on it or a happy dog on it does not mean that it's an actual green cleaning product. Turn the label around. And I'm hoping that just, just a few tips like this, just, just look at some of these. There's, these are the chemicals that we want to look out for. Don't get petroleum-based products. We are running low on petroleum. We need it for things like heating our buildings. We don't need it to make cleaning products. We don't need it to make makeup. We don't need it for all these other things. We need it for energy, so we can try to stay away from products that are petroleum-based, because it's not necessary. So these are some of the resources, like I said, you guys will get the presentation electronically, so you'll just be able to click on these. So these are specific to mold, these are the guides, this is the actual, the, the specific step-by-step -step guide that came out after Sandy to help own homeowners clean up. Some green cleaning resources. For those